Thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks. And uh, actually, just picking up on this uh, question about, about geography and, and, and titles, I moved to King's College two or three months ago and, and adopted this title of Professor of Climate and Culture very deliberately. Uh, in my previous work at the University of East Anglia uh, over 25 years had dealt with this idea of climate change but I felt that Professor of Climate Change didn't actually do justice to what I think are the really interesting and important questions uh, around this uh, thing that we call uh, climate change. Uh, so climate and culture is a very deliberate um, coinage. I, I don't know of any other professor in the world who uh, has sort of trading uh, under that particular label. But for me, bringing culture and all of the associated uh, manifestations of human culture, our imaginations, our stories, our narratives, uh, our efforts at making meaning, uh, together with this idea of climate, seems to me uh, a, a necessary foundation before we can actually go on and think about what climate change means for us and therefore how we should be responding to climate change. And so this topic, this title uh, that I've chosen for this lecture, Who Governs the Climate, th this is, uh, uh, I was just reflecting on this, when I started research on climate and society way back in my PhD studies in the early 1980s, I, I would never have conceived of this title. It, it just wouldn't have been imaginable to me to ask the question, who governs the climate? It's something that actually has uh, uh, increasingly uh, preoccupied me as I've uh, continued my studies on climate change. Um, and of course, as we've seen various uh, innovations around policy uh, and politics uh, dealing with this phenomenon of climate change over the last 25 years. But it does seem to me now actually a, a, a very important question to ask, given the variety of political and policy uh, innovations that we are seeing around or motivated by or, or justified by this idea of climate change. So um, that says a little bit about my own uh, journey in dealing with this subject and also why geography, I think, is actually very well placed to be able to bring together these different ideas of climate and of culture. So where I'm going to start off this lecture is just to reflect back just under two years ago now there was a major international meeting at L in London called Planet Under Pressure 2012 probably the largest gathering of global change researchers in the world that there had been and uh, at this uh, conference this big international conference uh, they came forward a very particular view or vision of how knowledge around global change, and for the purposes of, of my interests, I'm associating that with, with climate change. A very particular view of how knowledge about global change is related to political action in the world. Uh, and it's captured um, uh, quite well in this uh, uh, quote here from one of the conference organizers um, in a short commentary based on the, the conference. Achieving a sustainable world will require research to build the consensus required for effective action at national and global scales. There is no other viable way forward. So this is offering this very particular view then of how knowledge is made and comes forward into public life as consensual and how that knowledge then engages with political action. There is no other viable way forward. We need consensual knowledge in order to find effective political action at different scales in the world. And I'm interested and uh, in, in going to explore in this lecture just what is implied in this type of uh, vision. Because one could argue that uh, it is perhaps a notion of truth speaking to power uh, boldly and bravely, 
that consensual knowledge will be that which drives the political process. On the other hand, one could interpret such a vision as being a power grab by knowledge makers, by scientists, by global change researchers. That if there is no other viable way forward than politics being driven by consensual knowledge, then actually there is handing over of power from politics to science. And I'm interested in exploring what actually lies behind this sort of statement. But before uh, I pursue that uh, more directly, uh, I, I want to lay the, the foundation by uh, offering a very short um, account of how the idea of climate itself has evolved in human culture. Uh, because even to ask the question, who governs the climate, um, might seem rather odd. Certainly for many uh, uh, societies in different eras, it would seem a very odd question to ask, who governs the climate? Well, the climate? The climate isn't governed. So we need to understand a little bit about the trajectory of, of, of thought uh, uh, around this idea of uh, climate. Uh, and of course, um, if we do take this deeper uh, historical uh, understanding of the idea of climate, uh, then something very obvious uh, uh, comes to mind, and that is that humans have always lived with their climates in a state of anxiety and concern. I, I would argue that one could trace back through uh, centuries and through millennia to the earliest accounts that we have uh, of uh, human social living and find evidence of this anxiety. Climate somehow doesn't quite perform uh, in the way that uh, we might want it to do. Uh, the uh, Romanian historian Lucien Boyer in his great book, The Weather in the Imagination, uh, 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 narrates this. The history of humanity is characterized by an endemic anxiety. It is as if something or someone is remorselessly trying to sabotage the world's driving force and particularly its climate. Uh, so this is uh, uh, nothing new. Um, humans have always struggled to make sense of the capriciousness, the uncontrollability of the climates that they live in. It never quite does what we want it to do, and we wish, we wish we actually had control over the weather. And different cultures in different historical settings have... Uh, found ways to try to make sense of this anxiety, of this tension, of this frustration, uh, if you like. So a couple of examples uh, from medieval uh, or late uh, or early modern Europe um, uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, we can draw attention to. So in the, 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 the Little Ice Age in the 15th and 16th century, uh, it became uh, not uncommon for severe or abnormal weather uh, in Central Europe to uh, be interpreted as evidence of uh, witchery. Uh, witches, females in particular, were claimed uh, to be those responsible for the misbehaviour, uh, the misperformance of the weather. Wolfgang Beringer's studies uh, 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 develop uh, this narrative uh, very well. Uh, or else um, the uh, implication of divine agency uh, in, the, in the weather, uh, uh, of course, not an uncommon uh, way of thinking culturally uh, about climate. Uh, and so the example here I give, the storm, the great storm of November 1703 in England, uh, which was uh, very vividly recorded by Daniel Defoe, um, one of the first journalistic accounts uh, of uh, uh, weather extremes and damage. Uh, and this, uh, his book was actually called The Storm. 8,000 lives were lost, half the Royal Navy was destroyed in this hurricane. Um, but what was interesting is that the, that the nation, 
uh, uh, gathered uh, two months later uh, in Westminster Abbey to ask for God's forgiveness and blessing on the nation because the storm had been evidence of God's displeasure with the moral performance of the English people. And so the idea of climate being um, a manifestation uh, of God's judgment or blessing, again, is a trope that we can find uh, successively being used in different uh, cultural settings. But then as we move through the 18th uh, century and into the 19th century, as, as part of the uh, 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 Enlightenment movement in Europe, uh, understanding of climate and its behavior began to change. Uh, so we uh, saw that weather became uh, enumerated, it became measurable part of this whole enlightenment project of bringing uh, order uh, and numerical precision to nature. So meteorological instruments, barometers and thermometers uh, were uh, innovated and they were standardized so that a measurement of temperature in, in England was the equivalent of a me uh, temperature measurement uh, in Italy uh, so that these measurements could be commensurated uh, and weather therefore became, uh, in, in a sense, much more manageable uh, descriptively. Uh, Vlad Yankovic's book, Reading the Skies, and uh, Jan Galinsky, uh, uh, in his book, uh, Climate of Enlightenment, um, talking about this in the uh, 18th century, uh, tells the story very well. And so what happened then, uh, our understanding of climate uh, 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 became much more instrumental in a literal sense as well as a metaphorical sense. So these standardized measurements uh, of climate, uh, for example, allowed the European colonists <coughs> moving into imperial, uh, into tropical uh, regions to be able to compare the climates of Jakarta and of Delhi uh, and of uh, Rio de Janeiro through this enumeration and one could embark on agricultural and industrial projects in the sure knowledge that climate now was measurable, was containable, um, and could be used for economic uh, and commercial gain. This was part of the purification of nature, if you will, to use Bruno Latour's uh, idea. But interestingly, as we move into the 19th century, as uh, uh, if you like, uh, nature and the weather, climate became disenchanted through this instrumentation. Uh, it nevertheless also, uh, I at least in some quarters, became politicized in a new way uh, for the first time. This modernist uh, project had other uh, repercussions. And so these now were secular explanatory frameworks of weather's misbehavior, no longer calling upon witches or the divine, but actually drawing attention to the connection between climatic behavior and social and political organization. Uh, and this is very well illustrated uh, in uh, uh, the writings of, of Charles Fourier, utopian uh, French socialist, uh, in the 1820s. This is uh, drawn out very well from work by uh, Locher and Frazot, recently published. Uh, and I just take one quote here from uh, Fourier's uh, lament uh, about the climate. The climatic disorder is a vice inherent to civilized cultures that disrupts everything due to the battle between individual and the collective interest. So what, what Fourier was talking about here now was not uh, seeing agency uh, in the gods, uh, in the spirits, but actually that climate was a manifestation uh, of unjust or unequal social relations or inappropriate political organization within uh, uh, contemporary society. Climate became a political object. So for, 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 for Fourier, land clearance, forest decline, rampant individualism, uh, for him, these became the cause 
of wayward climates. Without political association, he wrote, by which he meant a, a, a more socialist uh, vision uh, of organization. Those great labors which are necessary to bring the earth and the atmosphere into a healthy condition are impossible. Uh, and of course we uh, live now with the uh, legacy of this modernist, enlightened uh, thinking, but also we live still with a legacy, uh, certainly in many cultures around the world, and even in the vernacular thinking of many in our own culture, I think we live with a legacy still of the role of the spirits, of the divine, of the transcendent, somehow being caught up in our understanding of how and why weather behaves the way it does. Uh, this um, is uh, drawn out, uh, for example, by Simon Donner in his short essay in 2007 called The Domain of the Gods, uh, where he draws attention to these enduring uh, uh, ways of interpreting uh, weather and climate behavior in different parts of the world. And what this suggests to me that these coexisting worldviews, if you will, um, uh, suggest uh, a number of uh, uh, different types, uh, and I've just summarized them here uh, in a very simplistic way, depending on whether one sees any role at all for the divine uh, uh, in uh, uh, weather uh, 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 management, uh, <coughs> and also whether, to what extent at least, one sees the relevance of human agency. So this simple two by two, um, matrix uh, suggests maybe these four different types of approach that I think one can find still in our own societies, but certainly in uh, cultures around the world today. Religious optimists, those who actually see the weather under divine control and that humans uh, are relatively um, uh, powerless. The religious fatalists, um, Sorry, th those would be the religious optimists would see that actually human agency matters, that by uh, appropriate moral behavior, uh, then God's blessing will be guaranteed uh, through a benevolent uh, climate. Uh, the religious fatalists are those who actually see that human uh, 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 behavior is uh, ineffective in the face of uh, God's uh, uh, inscrutable ways. Uh, and for those who see no divine agency, again, one can compare and contrast between those who see effective human agency, uh, the liberal progressives, as I call them here, uh, and the uh, uh, fatalists or the hedonists who actually see that, well, there's nothing that humans can do uh, in, in this um, uh, uncontrollable uh, 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 weather system. Um, uh, and we just have to make the, the most uh, of things as best we can. So, so my point here is to uh, lay some uh, groundwork, uh, some historical and cultural groundwork for thinking uh, about how we come to this current project uh, that we seem to have embarked upon, uh, which is to uh, bring global climate back under some form of human management. Uh, and although these different worldviews, as I argue here, I think still do coexist in our society, nevertheless, the dominant paradigm, certainly the dominant paradigm amongst the scientific elite and amongst the political elite, uh, is the paradigm that I is represented in this diagram, the famous Bretherton diagram um, from 1988 in NASA's report on Earth System Science. It was the first coinage of this term, Earth System Science. And of course, it shows this sort of classic wiring diagram to show how the climate system operates, uh, the interactions between the different physical parts of the system, the cryosphere, the biosphere, the ocean, uh, the atmosphere, uh, and so on. With human uh, activities, interestingly, over there on the right-hand side in this, uh, in this black box, these are human activities. But they're embedded in this much larger system uh, of these uh, natural physical uh, forces uh, which science, uh, through its methodology and through its computer simulations, uh, are able to uh, represent adequately. And this is the, the dominant paradigm, uh, I would suggest, uh, 
uh, that uh, underlies the current project of trying to bring climate uh, under human control. Uh, and this project then um, that we have seen emerge over the last 25 years, the IPCC, for example, was founded in 1988, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. Uh, this project uh, is uh, emblematic uh, of what James Scott ha has called uh, high modernism. His book, Seeing Like a State, um, how certain uh, schemes to improve the human condition have failed, as he subtitled it. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, uh, project of trying to manage global climate I is a classic example of what Scott uh, would call the high modernist uh, moment. Uh, because what we've seen in my brief account as well, I could say, is that we have uh, in the 18th century uh, enumerated the weather, we've measured the weather, we've standardised, we've commensurated. Uh, in the 20th century, we've established simulation techniques to be able to predict the weather and to predict the climate of the future. And this then allows us, through enumeration and through prediction, to be able to at least uh, uh, lay out the grounds for regulating the climate. As we've seen in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or in Article 2 of the UNFCCC, the ultimate objective of this, uh, this convention is to stabilise uh, uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases to avoid dangerous climate change. This is a, uh, a high modernist project, as Scott would see it. We, we, we measure, we simulate, and then we can regulate the climate. And in this sense, the, the climate change project falls into this other category of state projects uh, to control territory, the nation state, through cartography, to control people, the citizens of the state through censuses, to control the economy, the wealth making activities of the state through this uh, index uh, that we call GDP. <coughs> now we can bring climate under state control. Or in fact, uh, of course, through the UN, through international, intergovernmental control. And this line of thinking then immediately, uh, uh, of course, brings us to uh, Foucault uh, and his idea of governmentality. How do we think about governing? Uh, and his arguments uh, that he developed through his work in the, in the 70s um, uh, uh, that uh, started to talk about the rationalities of government. What is it that is being governed? And how is it that those entities are being governed, the technologies uh, of government, uh, as he put it? And so for Foucault, these things are deeply... Uh, entangled, creating the objects of government through knowledge, through enumeration, uh, through simulation, is inescapably bound up in these projects of uh, 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 governmental uh, and policy uh, intervention. So just as the economy became defined through GDP and the that the political project of most governments is to ensure the growth in GDP of two, three, four percent per annum. <coughs> so with climate, we can make a parallel uh, argument, it seems to me, that, that this gov notion of governmentality gives us uh, some insight uh, into what is ostensibly happening with our attempts to govern. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> uh, science then, uh, with its increasing array of instrumentations now going beyond just the thermometers and the barometers of the 18th century, we now have the satellites in space. Uh, <coughs> we now have the probes that go down into the deep ocean. Uh, we have all sorts of uh, instrumental 
uh, technologies uh, to be able to uh, bring this entity that we call global climate into this uh, high modernist project. Uh, the knowledge that the IPCC has collated uh, over the last 25 years. We have indices like global temperature. Uh, we have uh, concepts like global warming potentials. Different greenhouse gases are commensurated through their global warming potential. So one can compare the effect of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide and the CFCs, allowing the state or the intergovernmental machinery to be able to regulate these entities. We have Earth system science models that allow us to simulate the effects of different policy interventions on the system. These are global kinds of knowledge that, you again using Foucault's idea of governmentality, allow certain types of um, uh, technologies of control to be implemented. And so critical in this project over the last 20 years or so has been the emergence of the key uh, objective of this form of uh, managerial uh, intergovernmental control. It's the idea of two degrees. Two degrees above pre-industrial in the global surface average temperature index is what the political project is now all about. This, uh, of course, again, it, it's got its own history to it, particularly in the EU, who first started uh, uh, talking uh, in this language of two degrees uh, as far back as 1996. Um, but now intergovernmentally, from Copenhagen in December 2009, we uh, have this object uh, of intergovernmental uh, control in front of us as COP uh, as the Copenhagen Accord in COP15 said, um, the world's governments recognise the scientific view that the increase in global temperature should be below 2 degrees Celsius. This is the logic of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the logic of avoiding dangerous climate change. Uh, this is the logic of a modernist uh, project. And it's been picked up in political... Uh, uh, language or rhetoric is Tony Blair, um, again using the same type of indexed thinking. We have a window of only 10 to 15 years to avoid crossing catastrophic tipping points, by which he means exceeding um, the, 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 the likelihood, uh, whatever likelihood, 50%, 80%, exceeding the likelihood of exceeding two degrees um, of warming. So climate governance, governing the climate, is all about achieving this specific goal. It changes the way in which we talk about it in the public, it changes the way in which we think about policy interventions. And so we can have Ban Ki-moon um, representing the governments of the world through the United Nations, laying out the responsibility of the world's leaders in terms of achieving this two-degree target. Here he is speaking uh, at the Durban uh, summit two years ago at COP17. It will be difficult, he said, to overstate the gravity of this moment. Without exaggeration, we can say the future of our planet is at stake. The science is clear. The IPCC tells us that greenhouse gases must be reduced by half if we are to keep the rise below two degrees. You are the people who can bring us from the edge. The world is looking to you for leadership. So what I find here, interestingly here, is how this knowledge, this particular type of knowledge, scientific knowledge about climate change, and its representation in this two degree target becomes the defining motive and justification for political action in the world. 
Ban Ki-moon challenging the world's leaders gathering in Durban. Leadership in the world becomes redefined, if you will, as governing the climate, keeping it within two degrees. The behaviour of the people, the trajectory of technology, the management of the economy, the organisation of society, all of these things need to be brought into this overarching goal of keeping global temperature below two degrees. And following this language, this framework, this um, uh, 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 objective, uh, we then see the uh, world's knowledge communities uh, organising themselves in such a way as to ostensibly make this possible, make it possible to uh, ensure that two degrees is not exceeded. So we have the, the new Future Earth initiative that came out of the London conference that I mentioned right at the very beginning in 2012, the new Future Earth system and new knowledge arrangements uh, to bring together all of the different knowledge communities um, to ensure that uh, our knowledge of the planet will serve uh, this uh, overarching goal. Or we could uh, uh, look at uh, projects like the Earth System Governance uh, Project uh, that is uh, run uh, under the International Human Dimensions Programme led by uh, Frank Bierman. Um, calling for new governance systems, world governance systems, a fundamental reorientation and restructuring, he says, of national and international institutions towards more effective earth system governance and planetary stewardship. So, again, knowledge, the institutions of knowledge, the forms of governance need to be reconfigured in order to achieve the high modernist objective of keeping the world's temperature below two degrees. Now I will be uh, uh, showing why I am hesitant and sceptical of this uh, project um, uh, in the remaining part of my lecture. Um, uh, but let me just give you three more examples of, of how this, um, this move towards these new, th these new knowledge systems and these new governance systems uh, are, are taking shape. Here are quotes from three of them. Future Earth, which is this new partnership that came out of the London Conference uh, in 2012. Uh, Future Earth says, uh, our, on our institutional arrangement will transform the way of doing research, bringing together different fields of science, linking global change, research to development concerns, and delivering the knowledge to support solutions. Uh, or the International Social Science Council that challenges the social sciences to take the lead in developing a new integrative, transformative science of global change. Or the Belmont Forum, transdisciplinary collaboration to address the coupled environmental and socio-economic solutions to environmental change. I will say what I find troubling about these things in a minute, but just notice how the orchestration of these programs uh, is all using the same type of narrative. Um, that we need this integrative, consensual knowledge in order to make political action effective in the world. And underlying a, a lot of this, I would argue, still lies this, uh, what's been called the linear uh, model uh, of science policy uh, interaction. The sense, as we saw in the Planet Under Pressure statement, consensual knowledge is necessary to derive uh, uh, political action. Uh, two uh, examples of this uh, in recent years around climate change. Here's the he Guardian headline, uh, uh, the Guardian newspaper in England, uh, after the IPCC published its fourth assessment report six years ago. Front page headline, UN's vast report will end the scientific argument. Now, now will the world act. Once the scientific argument is ended, that 
paves the way, it opens the doors, opens the gates for political action uh, in the world. Or, or from a couple of years later, uh, at the uh, pre-COP15 Science Co Congress in Copenhagen in March 2009, the Danish Prime Minister, uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, on a panel at the end of this conference with 1,500 scientists having been gathered, gathered there, he laid out a challenge to these climate scientists uh, and said, politicians can only act on what we know and therefore your contribution is central. And I would give you this piece of advice not to provide us with too many moving targets because it already is a very complicated process. I need fixed targets and certain figures and not too many considerations on uncertainty and risk and things like that. So this is the under, undertow, the underlying mentality or governmentality, to use Foucault's phrase. Uh, which drives forward uh, this project of trying to govern the world's climate. The IPCC itself, over its 25-year history, here is John Horton, who chaired the first uh, Working Group 1 report back in 1990. And in the, in the forward of that report, he said, I'm confident that the IPCC will provide the necessary firm scientific foundation, the consensual knowledge, that will drive forward the response and strategy and action regarding the issue of climate change. This has been the way in which uh, uh, the world has approached the governing of global climate. And so now I'm coming to my, this, this juncture in my talk to, 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 to argue why uh, I find this, this concerning um, and somewhat worrying. Um, particularly when we think, start thinking uh, about forms of political uh, uh, organisation, uh, not least democracy. Uh, and so I counterpart, counter uh, position Horton's claim here in 1990 with the firm scientific foundation for political action uh, with a comment that um, uh, Jean Goodwin, a professor of uh, uh, English language and rhetoric at Iowa State uh, uh, offered uh, just a couple of years ago, maybe those of us who favour doing something about climate change should admit that our policies aren't going to have a firm foundation and start arguing about values and solutions instead. And she made this comment uh, uh, as a result of analysing all of the um, media and internet uh, discourse in the run-up to the Copenhagen summit in 2009 uh, where she argued or showed that the posts, internet posts around uh, uh, climate science outnumbered those posts dealing with climate solutions by a ratio of two to one, but they outnumbered the number of posts dealing with human beliefs and values by a ratio of ten to one. So the, the discourse leading up to Copenhagen was all about climate science and it was virtually nothing at all <coughs> about human values uh, and human beliefs. Maybe the firm foundation that Horton was trying to provide through the IPCC to drive forward political action isn't in fact uh, such a firm foundation for political action, effective political action, as uh, uh, some of these commentators would like it to be. And so this is the problem for me <coughs> that we can talk all we want about earth system science models and predictions of future climates and about consensus knowledge produced by the IPCC. And we can talk about urgency. But if we don't talk about how we organise ourselves collectively, politically, in order to enact change, which deals with, therefore, the more troubling and difficult questions of divergent human values and beliefs, then I think uh, we're on a, a pathway uh, uh, that is potentially uh, uh, dangerous.
And so I suggest these are the sort of questions uh, <coughs> that actually should be asked by these new institutions that are coming forward, whether it's Future Earth or Earth System Governance uh, or the Belmont Forum uh, and so on. It's not simply about integrative knowledge. It's not simply about consensual statements. It actually is about thinking about what is the relationship between expert knowledge and the wishes of the people. It's around different conceptions of what actually is the good life. What is it that humans are trying to do with their project on this planet? It's questions around to what extent should governments be trying to re-engineer cultural norms and behaviours? What is the right balance between volunteerism and coercion in order to reorganise a society? It is about the forms of democracy that we actually want to establish and pass on to future generations. Representative, participatory, centralised. It is asking the question, what is wrong, in fact, with an authoritarian environmentalism, which is what certainly a number of commentators around climate change would suggest the world needs. We have not got the luxury of democracy in the face of the challenge of governing the world's climate. These are examples for me of the sorts of questions that actually are much more important to ask uh, in the face of climate change. And they're difficult questions to find answers to because actually there is no final answer to any of these. These are the, uh, the, the raw material, of course, of, of political life. This is what we argue about. This is why we disagree uh, at all forms of our social organisation, whether in small uh, uh, groups uh, like here, and I guarantee if we uh, started opening up these questions in an audience of just 100 of us uh, in this uh, city of Nijmegen, then we will end up disagreeing about a lot of these questions, uh, let alone the 7.2 billion people uh, that live on the planet. Uh, and social scientists or, or science and technology scholars, of course, also disagree about this, but at least they engage the questions. I just caricature some of this debate here between... Um, Harry Collins and Sheila Jasanoff, um, <coughs> who, who bring to the foreground at least why these questions are difficult ones, but also why they are important ones. Collins, um, uh, uh, in his article uh, uh, where he uses this idea of the third wave uh, of science technology studies, where he, uh, if you like, uh, pulls back uh, and argues that actually uh, there is a, a much more decisive role for expertise and technical knowledge uh, in political life. Uh, whereas Jasanoff challenging Collins' uh, move in this direction would, would lay out the claim um, uh, that experts always need to be uh, held accountable to a, a more deliberative participatory form of democracy. There are no questions that the public uh, should be excluded uh, from deliberating. Now, uh, these are difficult uh, debates, and I'm not saying there are easy answers to them. Uh, 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 taking Collins's position where he gives greater weight to expertise and decision-making um, uh, and would give greater weight on consensus-type processes of fact-building amongst scientific elites... Uh, the dangers uh, of that approach uh, is captured by hegemons uh, and the exclusion of the excluded uh, uh, views of society. Uh, the, the dangers of, of Jasanov's uh, overly deliberative and participatory approach, uh, uh, recognising that actually dissensus on values will always be prevalent uh, in political dis dis discussions. The dangers here is a collapse into relativism um, and mere identity politics that prevents us from making uh, any types of clear political actions in the world. So these are difficult debates and deliberations to have, 
Uh, but they are important ones to have. And what is noticeable is in a lot of the international programs around knowledge and governance that I was alluding to before, these types of discussions are, uh, are absent. They are elided, they are erased, as though they have got no uh, importance. And let me give you one very specific example of why this matters, why critically it actually matters to have these uh, types uh, of arguments. Uh, and I use the example of climate engineering. Um, a range of different forms of technologies that are being proposed in order to much more directly govern the climate through technology. Uh, and just one in particular to draw attention to, one that has perhaps gathered the greatest amount of attention in recent years, the idea of injecting sulfur into the stratosphere uh, to create tiny particles of aerosols that can act as effective uh, shields uh, uh, reflecting uh, shortwave radiation back into space, therefore offsetting some of the surface warming uh, that is being caused by greenhouse gas accumulation. Sulfate uh, aer aerosol injection, uh, a technology uh, uh, which is receiving increasing attention and funding, certainly in North America and uh, some European countries. Uh, and, and the issues here um, that I raise are then uh, directly connected to my previous list uh, of questions. Because they're questions such as these, who governs? Who governs the research that is undertaken here? Because when we're dealing with aerosol injection, you can do a lot of simulation work in models, but in the end, if you're actually going to experiment with this technology, then it actually means experimenting with the global atmosphere. So the, the, the distinction between research and implementation becomes blurred. To find out whether the technology works or not, you have to inject into the global atmosphere. Who governs that process? Who declares the climate emergency at which point the advocates of aerosol injection would say, now is the time to act? Whose hand is on the thermostat that would then be created? This ability to manipulate the dial of global temperature for the fate of humans uh, and their non-human companions. And in this whole process, in this whole cascade of questions that, that sulfate aerosol engineering opens up, who is the, whose voices are those voices that are heard and acted upon? And whose voices uh, are those that are excluded and made silent? So for me, the, the questions here are very, very precise and real. These are not arbitrary or abstract. This is happening now, uh, and uh, it argues for me why uh, questions about governance and power and democracy uh, need to be asked at this moment. Now, it's not just a case of doing the analysis before one asks these questions of governance. It's a question about stopping first to ask who controls before one does the uh, risk analysis. So let me uh, conclude um, because it may seem that therefore uh, uh, this suggests if one follows through my critique uh, fully that uh, we may inhibit ourselves in taking any actions at all that might diffuse or minimise the risks and dangers of climate change. If climate cannot be governed, or at least if um, the forms of democracy that we might instinctively prefer make it difficult to enact decisive solutions, then we simply do nothing. <laughs>
Well, that's not my concluding point. My concluding point uh, is simply to recognize that there are different ways of which we may try to uh, uh, intervene uh, in the system. It's not a case of trying to govern the climate. Certainly, it's not a case of trying to control everything so that we keep below a, uh, an arbitrary two-degree target. But there are other ways that I think are more sympathetic to uh, and more responsive to the sort of democratic and um, value-based concerns that I've drawn attention to that I think can be uh, implemented. And just briefly, um, uh, to finish uh, on these, although there's, there's an awful lot more, of course, that could be said about this, um, just a couple of words then um, about moving away from these uh, overarching um, global control paradigms to ones that I think are more responsive to democratic concern and actually I would also argue are more um, consistent with the, f with the knowledge that we have about how a complex uh, nonlinear system uh, such as the planetary climate system um, with all of our incomplete and provisional knowledge is actually more sympathetic too. Uh, so it's recognizing uh, pluralism in, in, in many different dimensions. Pluralism in our knowledge, that we don't simply have one single consensual knowledge system. Uh, and actually, uh, in, in the different forms of knowledge that we have about the climate system, there are going to be embedded diversities uh, of values. Uh, therefore, the advice that comes forward from elites from scientific elites, from analytical elites, as Andy Sterling would put it, uh, should become plural and conditional and not hegemonic and consensual. There is no one way in which the climate should be governed. Uh, our ethics, we need to recognize, are going to be plural, as Kaminga uh, does in his uh, article in 2008. The value systems that different societies and cultures bring into public life are going to be different. And therefore our communication, as Kahan and his work at Yale has shown, uh, needs to be pluralistic, to give recognition to this diversity of beliefs uh, and values. And so on the one hand, it's about pluralism. Uh, on the other hand, it's about polycentrism. This is the work or the phrasing uh, of the late uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Um, moving away from the unicentric architectures which have dominated the global institutions that we've seen in the last 25 years to more polycentric uh, architectures. As she puts it here, uh, <coughs> it would be better to self-consciously adopt a polycentric approach to encourage experimentation and learning from diverse policies adopted at multiple scales. This is a way of, if you will, governing the climate that does more justice to plurality and indeterminacy and to conflicting and competing value systems. And it's both pluralism and polycentrism then that has um, uh, 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 inspired and guided uh, the uh, rather eclectic group of us who in the last three or four years uh, operated under the name of the Hartwell Group uh, and, and what we call climate pragmatism. The first Hartwell paper came out in 2009 um, and again, there's a lot more to be said about this. Um, uh, uh, and we wouldn't use the, 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 the notion of governing uh, the climate uh, in the way that we approach the problem. Um, but equally, we, we recognize that there are ways of doing policy that will reduce the risks and dangers uh, of climate change. Um, so in our simple threefold a uh, formula for climate pragmatism. It's not about the overarching goal of two degrees. Uh, that is both unattainable, it's hubristic, uh, and it has latent within it uh, uh, what I would suggest is an anti-democratic sentiment. For the climate pragmatism, it's about recognizing that there are multiple ways that humans off, uh, alter the climate system. There are short-term forces. Um, uh, that we can attend to in multiple ways that bring about 
uh, very large and significant welfare co-benefits, whilst at the same time reducing the human imprint uh, on the system. It's about adapting to climate risk. Adaptation to weather dangers is a public good, period. Uh, and we should be seeking ways to innovate uh, <coughs> uh, constantly across our societies uh, to minimise the risks and dangers of weather. And then it's about the third pillar, which is around uh, energy uh, transitions. We do need massive investment in new energy technologies to take us away from carbon-intense energy technologies. And there are ways of doing that uh, through public-led innovation programmes. But the emphasis here would be as much on energy rights, the three billion people who do not have access to reliable, secure electricity to give them the sorts of standards of living that we would regard as basic. It's as much about energy rights as it is about governing the climate. So uh, there's a lot more to be said about this, but what I'm concluding then uh, in this uh, 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 lecture, um, who governs the climate? Uh, I, I would argue that the climate is ungovernable uh, and that we... Uh, lay ourselves open to dangerous um, illusions of control and mastery uh, if we actually set out on this project of trying to limit uh, global temperature to two degrees. Uh, I think we need more decentralizing narratives that work with different policy frameworks and configurations of interests that can do much greater justice to the diversity of values and beliefs that we hold within and across and between our societies in the world. And these are ways that are more in tune uh, with democratic thinking and governance uh, than the notion of governing the climate through a two degree uh, temperature objective. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>